Hello, everybody. I'm Peter Denning, your host, Harnessing AI course. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about data. We've been talking about machines, machine learning. We've talked about different types of machines, the expert system type of machine with rules, the neural network type of machine. Sometimes we call that supervised learning, the type of machine that inspects the data and groups it together into similarity classes. We call that unsupervised learning or a type of machine that plays games against other machines and becomes better and better. We call that reinforcement learning. And we talked about machines that team up with human beings. And, and um, we call that human machine teaming type learning. But we, we haven't talked much about the data that these machines use in order to, to do their job, especially the neural network type machines which receive, which require a lot of data to train them. And then you start relying on what those machines will tell you. And this part of, you know, how do we collect the data? How do we train the machine? How do we know when we can trust it? This is a big, giant issue. And it's, it's even got the name data science. And it's closely connected up with uh, machine learning. And so uh, today we have Professor Ross Suchard from the OR department, who's here. He's an expert in data science, an expert in data analytics. He's going to talk about the data problem. And well, it has many dimensions to it. And you'll see it's a complex problem. And there's a big need for data scientist type training to help us deal with this problem in, in the real world. Uh, Russ has uh, been here, what, about three years now? Third year now, yes. And, and he's. Uh, he came from the Army. He's, he's been uh, closely associated with data science in the Army for a long time. So he, uh, you can bring some of your stories into this as you talk. So please, welcome Ross Schuchard, and he will talk to you about data science and data and machine learning. Great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the intro. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Ross Schuchard, uh, as Peter said, at OR department. I've uh, been at MPS for about three years now. Uh, my previous life served as a data scientist uh, across DOD in various uh, capacities. Show of hands, anyone in here a data scientist? Anyone worked with one before? Okay, anybody want to become one? <laughs> so as Peter is mentioning, you kind of following in line with this hierarchy of machines conversation, this journey you've been on with harnessing AI, there's a large call for arms of being able to deal and harness data. And data science is the approach that we're attempting to be able to apply in a fashion to be able to derive insights from data. Whether it's a, from a scale of small data to extremely big data. And in between there we'll talk about sort of this journey that you've been on from some of these modeling perspectives and where that residently lies with a data scientist and how we work uh, in the scope of those uh, various machines that you've seen so far. So what we'll do today is, one, we'll define or attempt to define what data science is. And uh, the way we'll do that is we'll walk through some explicit examples. Okay? And uh, no better way to do that than to describe the workflow of sort of a data science process. And we'll walk through that collectively uh, step by step and examine that to see not only what we focus on as data scientists that really differentiates our skill set from others, but some of the common problems that do exist uh, across all sciences. Okay. So even if your perspective is not to become a data scientist, or eventually not even to maybe work in an organization that has them, data has true meaning to all of us, especially as leaders that are enabling and wanting to make better decisions. Understanding this process from a particular perspective is helpful, regardless of where you're on that spectrum of data science. So that's our goal is to be able to explain that in that context. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about data science in the Department of Defense. Okay. Similarities of what the regular world is encountering uh, as well within the department. And then obviously those operational and strategic differences that do exist. Okay. And uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about data. Actually, we're going to talk a lot about data. As Peter was talking earlier in the introduction, I 
you'll hear the term used more and more by senior leaders that says it's all about the data. Well, to an extent, but it's also about the models and those models that you've been learning about over the last few iterations of this lecture series. And then we'll close out with sort of what we'll call a cautionary tale so we can put this into perspective. Um, and just like we're learning about the idea of artificial intelligence, of what it can do, it's important to put the context around it so that we have not just our blinders up and blindly accepting things, but being able to articulate and understand the processes that go with it such that we understand the limitations as well. Okay, so what is data science? All right. So this was an article, a very famous article that came out of Harvard Business Review, 2012. Okay. It's a very provocative title. Okay. And uh, this was about the time that I became uh, an OR professional in the Department of Defense. Was not driven by this article. Um, but at the same time, I, I think it was capturing a common conversation at the time that's having to deal with all of this data, this digital exhaust that exists in the world right now. And as previously discussed in the series, computational power continues to increase uh, to a point where we're able to match some of these volumes of data and the variety and the velocity upon which it's created, such that we want to be able to harness in a way so we can derive insights from it. And that's really what a data scientist does at a face value. But knowing what you all have discussed in previous lectures in this series, if the job of the data scientist is to build models that tells us about the past and the present and eventually and currently even maybe predict the future, uh, could it be, such as shown in this Katie Nuggets article or this cartoon from just two years ago, uh, that a data scientist will put themselves out of a job. Okay? So eventually, if we can train something, if we can train a machine of higher complexity and so forth, can we ultimately have this happen in an automated fashion? Okay. So what is the reality and what is the hype of this? And hopefully, we can talk about a little of those today. But first, let's get down to sort of a baseline perspective. If you're taking a data science course at any institution, I challenge you to find a common definition for it. Okay? So it's an emerging field and uh, sort of derived from components of a lot of classical disciplines that uh, we sort of create a data science curriculum from. Computer science, statistics, et cetera, decision sciences. Uh, but let's, let's sort of resolve to this definition right here in that data science studies the analysis of data okay, and focuses on building models. And we'll talk about models a lot today, put those in the context of models we've seen before, and validating them against data. Okay. So given certain data, given the parameters we pull from that data, how can we validate those models such that we can properly perform analysis of data? And again, not only for just predictive actions, but currently giving ourselves an ability to explain a phenomenon that's taking place. Okay. And also, we can perform things like simulations that help explain phenomena, something that derives insights from the data. Okay. So at a base level, that's where we're at. Now, just like we say artificial intelligence can do X, Y, Z, and we speculate it can do this in the future, I think a lot has been thrown at data science as to what it can do with high aspirations, uh, where it can go in the future. Uh, but what I want to do is sort of develop a ground truth in some aspects of not only what data scientists do, but what they've accomplished so far. To put this in a context of examples that many of you might be familiar with. So first example, image recognition. The idea of providing an image to a computer or set of images such that the computer can learn from those images to be able to translate what that image is to a known identity. Okay? So if I give you a thousand pictures of a cat and I give you a new picture of a cat, uh, can the computer determine that it's from that sort of perspective of a cat based on those files? Okay? And image recognition has come a long way. Okay? It's a success story so far, whether in the commercial uh, area or in the Department of Defense for image recognition. Okay. Uh, think of just in your 
you know, I've got my iPhone here. Uh, if you upload thousands of your own personal photos, you can search by, by a member of your family and just return those results. You know, four years ago, that just was not happening. Okay? And it's become quite powerful uh, just from day-to-day -day tasks. Um, there's some other things that we take for granted. Okay? Ten years ago, those of you that had Gmail or other uh, free commercial software uh, offerings of, of email, uh, we were inundated with spam, okay? so just junk email all the time. That problem's basically gone for the most part. Um, and that recognition and seeing uh, through text analytics of being able to say what's good versus bad for a particular case and where it's coming from has led to something that just really isn't our problem as the end user. So the end user should be uh, seeing the benefits of data science, uh, but many times they don't know sort of what's going on under the hood. And that's kind of what we'll expose a few mm -hmm. items from today. Uh, next, recommender systems. I love talking about recommender systems. I think some of you have uh, experienced this, uh, not only in the applications I'll talk about, uh, but in the context of some of the models that you've discussed over the past few weeks. But think Netflix, right? Think of any of these online streaming applications where based on your history of what you're watching, you have new recommendations to you. Okay? Those systems are based on not only your behavior, but other entities within your geographic region, those that have chosen character profiles that are similar to yours, language, age demographic, et cetera, all to produce something that might be more relevant to you. So something like Netflix, where that recommendation system you know, years ago was not as powerful. Now that we've had more data to train and to learn, those recommendations are actually pretty good for the areas that have high populations. So when Netflix goes to a new area, it's more challenging, language differences, et cetera. Okay? But those are all things that I think we're used to. One thing that I would like to spend a moment on is predictive maintenance. Okay? So not only uh, in Department of Defense, this you know, is something that's quite beneficial in the commercial sector, um, but I will highlight uh, an example later on from a DOD perspective, and that predictive maintenance is something that we can incorporate into our formations today to one, save a lot of money, and two, to be able to keep systems operational in a more consistent fashion. Previously, we are on a time-based maintenance schedule for most of our systems that was uh, completely based on sort of original specifications of an engine or a component. And when you hit that time mark, whether it was uh, 400 hours on a given engine, you had to replace it, change it, modify it, et cetera. Well, given today's ability to add sensors to various components uh, throughout our maintenance profile of any of our systems that exist out there, we're able to receive this constant feedback to see what those baseline sort of data points should be at given intervals, and then we can have a conditions-based maintenance to be able to change those things out. And the last example I'll sort of show here from a more advanced is what's called RATE, and it stands for Rapid Analysis of Threat Exposure. This first came about in uh, about 2018, which was a joint venture between DITRA, which is the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and DIU, just up the road in Silicon Valley, which is the Defense Innovation Unit. And what RAID is, is simply wearable devices to put on employees at the end of the day that's taking observable myometrics from them okay? so with the goal of finding pre-symptomatic conditions for certain ailments such that a leader of an organization can see if a subset of their population is getting sick or has things that lead to downtime, really, and the loss of productivity. In DoD, that's essential for us, obviously, to maintain readiness at all times. This has evolved rapidly uh, over the last year and a half as this program came out pre-COVID, and now it's a primary driver uh, for some agencies to use for COVID analysis. All of that data emitting from all of those employees, thousands of employees, 
is run against parameters that have been chosen based on hundreds of thousands of individuals historically to show any relation with any of these pre-symptomatic conditions. So all of that is a data problem based on some modeling parameters that were chosen to be able to describe if there's some output to enable some decision to be made. Okay. But these are all advanced. But just think of, go back to your basic statistics course. Uh, some of you might shudder over that, but just the idea of regular regression or a simple you know, input parameter, which we'll call a predictor of just a stream of data can uh, ultimately show some relationship to an output variable uh, itself. Okay? And so think of like recruiting. Okay? So if I provide money to recruit and have an advertising campaign, whether it's for students at an academic institution or for just an uh, agency that you're trying to find employees for, if I provide more money over time and I see my outcome of more interest or more applicants, then we say that there's some correlation there, okay? So I bring that up to show that, while we might talk about a lot of advanced systems or advanced models here, a data scientist covers the gamut of very simple models to very advanced, and we have to be able to know, understand, and interpret those models such that we're relying upon the proper data to feed to those models, and then over time iterate and make sure that we're validating those models continuously. So next I want to transition to a data science workflow to show how this is put into action. So again, the reason why we can talk about this besides just the modeling aspect is that many of you will ultimately face a problem. Okay? And that problem uh, hopefully can be solved by somebody that's related to your team, your agency or whatnot. And Knowing the process uh, that a data, data scientist resides within allows you to sort of input sort of your participation into that process as well. Whether you're a manager or an employee of some system that has uh, the ability to uh, harness information from data. But step one, and we'll walk through this in a linear fashion, is defining the problem. We don't just go out and grab data most time, um, just see what emerges. We have to define what we're looking for or what sort of broad category that we want to uh, be able to define and exercise a problem for. And that really should drive the collection of data, so going out and capturing data, but also have this sort of word access there in that sometimes it's really difficult to not only collect data because of access restrictions. Sometimes those restrictions are meaningful and in place because of security measures, Sometimes it's because some agencies or entities or departments don't want you to see that data. Okay? It's something that uh, extends beyond the department, but is resident and could have implication if you don't have a full set of data to inform that model or build it from. And that can be a leadership challenge beyond just what the data scientist is focusing on, which is ultimately getting that data ready to prepare it, clean it, make it viable, for it to be consumed by a model, and then testing that model and making sure that model works appropriately such that we can ultimately deliver some results from it. Okay. So that's just a generic interpretation at very high level, uh, but I wanna make sure we have a good foundation in what those steps look like. Because again, there are different inputs around here that have implications for an overall organization, but it is, data scientists is really focused right here in their skill set of being able to truly harness and accurately model an abstraction of reality and or this transference of a model uh, to be able to account for the data that an organization might have or that interest that's driving that uh, problem to be uh, solved. While expertise lies here and a lot of effort is placed here, all of these steps are pretty important and some uh, might uh, spend a little more time than others. Uh, but I don't want this diagram here to suggest that these things happen in a sequential fashion because this is an iterative process. Each of those steps, while well, I'm showing this in an iterative loop here, there can be an iteration at each step, whether it's reformulating the problem definition, 
uh, going out and getting data, oh, I got the wrong data, or I didn't get all of the data, and going back and collecting and cleaning and whatnot. Um, but right here is where the data scientist resides. In getting this model right, tuning that model, we'll talk about specifically what that means in a bit here, but ultimately, understanding what's going on in this abstraction for this model such that we can move forward with a presentation of results. And this is a dynamic iterative process overall. As we'll see that models will become stale with time because data is constantly being created depending on the problem we're trying to solve. But we can go back at each of these stages as feedback loops to be able to say, well, maybe I need more data or I have new data or I need different data. Um, or changing the parameters of the model of what's being created um, and ultimately presenting results to the stakeholder who wants or needs to make a decision. And maybe those results don't match that problem definition, but right here is where we have to come back for the crux of the work of what a data scientist does. Okay, so we keep saying that, well, all these items are important, okay? And where that data scientist was focused at was really in that model area. And that's where the expertise is. So in this diagram here, I want to talk a little bit about, well, how do we get to a model and how do we validate it okay, to accurately go through these steps? And we can imagine the top level of this slide here, an actual system. So something that exists in reality. And there's an actual workload with that system that produces results. Okay? And from that workload and system, we can derive data such as in the form of measurement to inform the parameters of a model that we create to replicate what that system looks like. Okay. And our ultimate goal is to be able to create, after we curate and develop a model, that produces calculated results that allows us to answer this question over here. And that question is, well, do our calculated results accurately match what the actual results are, or to a certain extent, okay, whatever we think that, that variation can be. Okay, so that's how we get to a validated model. Based on the data received, we tune a model, develop some parameters that define what it's doing, produces an output, and if we can match that to what it says in the real world, then we have some semblance of success from that modeling perspective. Let's talk a little bit about prediction, though. So now we're going to add a little bit more complexity to it, but the base construct is the same. We're given that validated model that we discussed in the previous slide. Over time, as previously stated, we get more data or conditions change. Okay? So we need to see how this model holds up. And over time, we do this modification analysis that says, well, what's happened since this previous snapshot in time that we received this information? And we take that sort of delta, and we come up with new projected parameters to retune that model. Okay? And from there, we'll run our model again, and we'll get our estimated results. But this time, we have two forms of validation to be able to take a look at. First one is, well, did those parameters that we project, well, did they match what the actual workload is, what the actual parameters that uh, are the replication of the real world system? And then the third one, the final one is, do those results, again, match those actual future results that end up taking place? And from there, we need to have some sort of measurement of what is considered good or not, of what's a deviation uh, at those validation points. And that's simply a process that will be repeated over and over and over and over again to ensure that we receive the result that we find sufficient at these sort of decision points of comparison. And that ultimately is going on. That's what we spend a lot, most of our time doing. Okay? But it all goes back to more components, though. 
well, are we feeding it the right data? Uh, are we pulling the right data, et cetera? But generally from the construct, this is how modeling looks. OK, so kind of define data science. What does a data scientist do? We can see kind of where that might fit, that generic workflow within an overall work environment of an agency, department, et cetera. And then where does the kind of the critical skills of a data scientist reside? So to date, where does that reside in the Department of Defense? Well, we have some distinct entities that are spending an incredible amount of resources to be able to build this capability for us. Okay. So uh, three prominent ones I want to point out, starting on the left here, is the Jake, which is the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. And that is the driver of all AI sort of investments and uh, consolidation slash collaboration hub for AI research across the department. Okay. Now getting a little more specific as we go, um, this middle logo here is an Army specific entity that was formerly known as the Army AI Task Force. It was a task force for about a year and a half until it became a permanent fixture as it became what's now known as the AI Integration Center. That's co uh, located at Carnegie Mellon Computer Science Robotics uh, Department up there. And it's tapping into those research elements to be able to build more AI capability in general, but a large population of DOD data scientists reside there as well. And uh, a more uh, specific example uh, exists down at SOCOM uh, with the emergence of their data engineering lab. I'd be remiss not to bring up MPS, uh, where we have our own data science and analytics group here that's focused on operational data science and statistical machine learning applications, trying to build this workforce up to be able to handle the extreme amounts of data that are being created out there for us to be able to enable decisions to be made. Okay. All right. So we have those entities, um, but there's also an education side to it, too. Um, so y'all are taking classes right now, uh, learning about uh, uh, you know, what compromise or what comprises an AI sequence. Uh, but we are now seeing degrees and certificates emerge uh, that are deliberately called data science. Okay. So we have uh, certificates here at MPS, AFIT, uh, Air Force Institute of Technology, actually has a data science degree. And uh, we see um, a degree emerge at both of the service academies, uh, Naval Academy and uh, at West Point as well. Um, but given that there is you know, a large startup cost to getting folks that are those extremely talented model developers and uh, uh, kind of updating their skills that are dramatically changing as new technologies arise, there are also other opportunities for being able to insert sort of uh, uh, instruction across an education spectrum that don't just include graduate school offerings. Okay? So it's important that those continue to move uh, forward. In particular, the Army itself has identified an actual skill identifier for a data, data scientist uh, over the last two years just based on the demand from it and has its own requirements for it. All right, so let's get to some explicit examples here. So uh, Dr. Denning talked about uh, some neural nets uh, before. I think you all have covered that uh, in the last few weeks. This is just a, a nice uh, a sort of example of a model doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Okay? So this was uh, in uh, China uh, about two years ago, or a year and a half ago. And uh, simply uh, what, what was taking place were cameras on crosswalks that were programmed to be able to take snapshots of folks that were crossing a crosswalk when they weren't supposed to. And so jaywalking. And that camera was supposed to focus in on a facial component of a human element and then be able to process that facial recognition to uh, sort of a database of personnel. So what's happening here is there's a bus going by that has a picture of somebody from an advertisement. And it did exactly what it was supposed to do. It recognized the picture of a human recognized uh, it as such, put it against its model that was trained based on whatever pictures were provided of other people, and returned and actually issued a ticket to this individual. 
it became uh, newsworthy because this person was a uh, head of a conglomerate uh, at, uh, is a multi-billionaire, so it hit uh, a lot of stories and said, hey, uh, whoops. But it speaks to more than just a joke or a funny story in that, as I said before, the model did exactly what it was supposed to do. That's what it was trained to do. And being able to go back, modify that model to make sure it is accurately capturing a human that's walking or there is what it needs to do next. And it's not something that can just remain in this use case. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about establishing trust both from a modeling and a data perspective. We're going to look at three specific areas. Uh, we're going to call them selection bias, labeling bias, and then we'll conclude with explainability. So selection bias is kind of what it says. It means we're selecting the right data or the right features of data to inform our models. Okay? In this top line, we're saying, well, do we recognize that we have the right data, i.e. it's the data that is representative of the model and the problem we're trying to solve, or do we simply have the wrong data? Okay. Now I want to talk about a few examples of this to drive what that first bullet's saying. Um, in one of my previous roles, I was working in uh, the cyber field. And uh, we had a contract data science team that was constantly churning on products. And uh, one of the elements that they're working on was uh, a particular anomaly detection model to be able to see something across the network. Okay. Well, the data that they were working with um, was not network data, but it was data that was associated with a single machine, but it had you know, thousands and thousands of lines with it, of events, and they use that, train their model uh, uh, against it, and uh, kind of return with a, hey, we figured out what this is. So they go to brief a uh, significantly high-ranking individual about what it was, and uh, turned out that they had the wrong data. What they're looking at was just one single system that was producing its own alerts, not on the network, but on uh, think of your own you know, s security software on your system because someone kept log locking themselves out based on a password reset and they were just determined to get in there and it was firing off all these local alerts. But they were viewing the problem from a network perspective and they had applied not only the wrong data but the, they were using the wrong model for that type of thing that was going on and they didn't have the domain expertise to recognize it. It was a little bit late because they're at presentation of results phase. In that, if you have a specific problem, or sometimes what we refer to as narrow AI, it requires that specificity. And being able to take something to a general adaptation level is, it can be quite difficult at times. And at the same time, you know, we can run into things such as Simpson's paradox, which many of you probably have heard of before, in that just because you look at a data pattern across a subset of larger data, it can be sort of washed away when looking at a larger field of data. Uh, for instance, uh, there's many popular studies that have shown examples from this in that hiring data, if you're looking at particular sex, race, ethnicity, et cetera, and when looking at subpopulations, say, oh, this institution is doing quite well in that regard. But when you look at it from the macro perspective, some of those things are completely diluted, and it's showing a different perspective, and that's in that paradox. And being able to recognize that, among other things, as sort of having one foot in the statistician domain uh, kind of helps allow us to be able to validate what is going on. All right, labeling bias. Okay. So I think you've talked about labeling a lot, okay. and a lot of these different machines have their requirement for their particular model. I just want to talk about some examples in this, uh, in that when we say we're labeling data, um, a lot of these models, as we train them, we need to make decisions on how to label an appropriate thing. So think back to like 1,000 images of cats. Okay? Well, that's a cat, that's a cat, that's a cat. Right? Human labeling itself has shown to be problematic in many cases. Right? So I have two examples here, one of uh, uh, where in 
particular entity was farming out the labeling of sentiment, I is this positive or negative kind of tone of text, uh, but the text was English and they were uh, paying non-native English speakers to do it. And the results of that showed something that seems uh, like would be an issue that would arise, that they miss the subtlety of language that exists there. Okay? So that's one aspect of it. Another uh, a really famous example, um, and many examples coming from the medical field, that's relying a lot on machine learning applications to help harness and really bring forward more efficient processing of data, so it's that, you know, you know, doctors can make a more informed decision on patients. In these two separate instances, uh, one uh, was really asking non-medical professionals to listen to coughing audio. And if it sounded like X, Y, or Z, they label it as this type of potential condition, this type of pot potential condition, et cetera. Okay, well, uh, that turned out to be very problematic as well, right? as a lot of those did not match up to what a true professional uh, would have assessed those at. Uh, another famous study was polyp images uh, being looked at by non-medical professionals. Polyp images looking for you know, certain uh, uh, factors of a image and saying, well, that looks cancerous, that does not, et cetera, and being able to define those. The problem is that even with that human sort of, and we'll talk about in the loop or on loop, they were not the right humans. But the medically trained folks that could have answered those more uh, correctly you know, are busy doing other things and can't validate what that data looks like. But yet they're relying upon these systems to make the end decision based on what those models were built upon. And obviously that's problematic. Now, on the flip side, well, what if we use a machine to label something, sort of automate those tasks, kind of take that out of, of a requirement for humans to do? Well, it's certainly more efficient, right? If we automate that, let the machine take uh, advantage of it. But there's a new level of risk of being able to misinterpret any context, because the machine is going to explicitly do what you tell it to do. It can't take out context to a certain extent. Example for uh, a lot of us in this room uh, that I've faced is, well, when I receive a timestamp on an activity of something that uh, is an event, I've had numerous data sources that I've received that have upwards of 20 to 30 different timestamps. And the context of those are timestamp one, timestamp two, timestamp random digit. Well, if I'm you know, receiving that and I give that to an automated sort of labeling device, one of those is going to ch choose that as the default time parameter. And I've had this happen time and time again. So at some point, there's a trade-off there for these. We can't expect that we're going to have 100,000 oncologists looking at polyp images all the time. But we have to be able to allow for some element to take place here. Okay? So really, we're getting as a hybrid approach. But know that that trade-off exists, but we should classify it according to what we want to sort of uh, identify as different levels of risk. Okay. And the last example I want to uh, focus on is as such. So misinformation and disinformation is in, sort of on the forefront of a lot of folks right now. Um, coming out of election cycles, uh, we're going through a pandemic right now, and uh, kind of stirring up some provocative debates. Well, uh, the source of a lot of those are uh, uh, coming from the amplification of information from automated actors. Okay? So machines that are producing things for you, uh, whether they're acting in an automated fashion rudimentary or they're trying to uh, emulate what a human's doing. So that's the detection of bots as a, a sort of emergent field that's taken place over the last few years. And the analysis of those detection areas is quite limited. But these detection areas focus on many of the different models that you've seen over the last few weeks from a supervised and unsupervised approach. And it has intense meaning based on a lot of diplomacy is taking place online. Uh, a lot of engagements uh, are driving uh, 
sort of human information patterns. And we've seen from Pew lately that social media, as of you know, even two years ago, uh, has outranked print as a source of information. But when analysis is done to look at these different approaches, uh, of which on here we have uh, three basic approaches. One is an unsupervised approach. Uh, one is a supervised, and the third is a supervised approach. The overlap that exists between those looking at the same set of messages is dramatically different because those models were trained differently to look at specific characteristics. So I'm not saying either of them are wrong, but it just goes to show to an extent that when things are trained in a certain way and we have an evolving complexity of how data is transmitted and engaged with, that rules can change, perspectives can change, and ultimately, from this conversation that took place during the election of 2018, looking at these three prominent bot detection algorithms, when uh, analysis was taken to overlap all of those that were determined to be bots, of the original hundreds of thousands of accounts, only eight of those proved to be detected across all three. And uh, I'm going to close out with explainability. Just because we get that result, and this is uh, something from Google Flu Trends, uh, which was an effort at Google to be able to estimate the onset of flu based on folks' online user engagement, i.e. their Google searches. This was put forward as the pinnacle of data science for a while, in that whenever you make something in the nature, that's always a big deal. But the flu trends team achieved a 97% accuracy rate when compared to ground truth CDC data. So it was great, great model. The problem is when we were struck by an actual flu pandemic and a few years later, that same model missed the mark by over 140%. For a multitude of reasons, one, um, obviously a pandemic uh, is an extreme event. So a little different from based on historical trends. Two, folks' online behavior evolves over time as well, and it's a complex perspective. That model has been updated since, and they continue to try to improve it. Um, and that helps uh, kind of get back to that model construct of a data scientist examining that. But what I want to conclude with today is just a cautionary warning, something that uh, I know that you all are discussing across this whole spectrum of harnessing AI. But you know, even beyond DOD, we are investing in data science across the globe in a heavy nature. But we need to be able to expand that expertise and engage with expertise. So think back to the polyp example, to the medical exam uh, examples, et cetera, to be able to build that expertise, such that even if a data scientist is an expert on a particular model, they might not have that domain expertise to be able to classify what the results are in context of that, even if they have a great accurate prediction. While these things are in their earliest stages, really we're at the kind of component in the department that seeing ourselves in the data is the first step and getting the data is part of that first step. When you see the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff saying it's all about the data, that's a very significant event that's taken place in just the last year. Never before we see a senior leader talking about data, um, but that's showing how important this is to us. But Know that models are always developed on past data, right? And to use them if we want to predict something and forecast that future and forecast those future uh, parameter values, that we have to continually update and reassess where we're at. Okay? And forecasting anything into the future is a highly uncertain process. So if someone gives you a point estimate that this is going to happen in the future, know that there is uncertainty around that. Now, with better models, better data, we can kind of close the uncertainty on that a little bit. But know that there are complexities and contingencies and just surprises that happen in the real world, whether it's the regular world that's outside, but also definitely within the Department of Defense from our perspective. So even if we have a great validated model, it still can be a poor predictor. Right? So with that, I hope uh, 
Uh, we've had a good moment to talk about what data science is, what that workflow is, where you can see it sort of fitting into any of your organizations, such that you can partake in it, whether you want to be a data scientist or not. Uh, but ultimately, we're all going to be sort of consumers of any of these outputs from any data science work. So thanks for your attention, and uh, we'll open the floor for any questions.